Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And let us say this opening prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Now, if you're able, please stand with me as we have our opening hymns. So let's sing this out for God. That hymn really talks about God's saving work, his love for us. And with that in mind, we head to the part of a service called the confession. Uh, it's a time where we can bring things before God that are kind of weighing us down, maybe things we know we might, maybe shouldn't have done or should have done. It's a time to bring our consciences um, before him. And so God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. In a moment of silence, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. And let us say, Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. 
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who is in his great mercy, has promised the forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Now, a very special day today. It's a very special day because we're here to celebrate the baptism of Layla. And for those of you who are here today, we've decided, haven't we, not to do it here. Where did we do it, Layla? Back there. And we have the baptismal fonts at the entrance of the church, which is quite interesting, <coughs> because it really signifies that as we enter this building, we are covered by God's grace. So in some very posh churches, people may dip their finger in the water when they walk in and kind of give them a sign. It just reminds them that they are part of God's family. And so that's why we're going to be doing it over there, because we're celebrating uh, that Leila and her parents are very much part of our church family. Well done. And let's sing together. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Well Thank you. <laughs> Everyone came here just for you. That was that special. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Well done. She'll remember this. Jesus Christ is come. Beyond your companions, your robes are all fragrant with 
myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honour. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. This is the word of the Lord. Wonderful. A very encouraging word there from Psalms. And before we come to our New Testament reading, I'm just going to have a short introduction because today we are starting a brand new series at St. John's looking at the book of Titus. Okay, It's one of the shorter books in the New Testament. And throughout the year, we like to make sure we have a good diet of different parts of the Bible. So we're going to be spending three weeks in Titus. And the title of our series is consistent living, okay? And hopefully this series is going to be a really practical time for us. And this week I'll be unpacking some of the contents uh, to this book. And actually, Lorna, if you just want to fast forward to the slide. Um, So this week I'm going to look at the context of the book. Next week we'll be looking at what the Apostle Paul, he's the author, considered to be a Christian response to that. And in the final week, um, Richard will be exploring how Christ as saviour figured in Paul's theology. And actually, we just had a baptism where we looked at the idea of Christ being saviour. So it's very relevant for us even today. So that's consistent living as context. Next slide. Consistent living, uh, what it means to be a Christian, and consistent living in Christ. Okay, so context. Who was... Titus. Well, Titus was a Greek Christian and a trusted co-worker of Paul. And Titus had already helped Paul out of a few difficult situations. For example, he accompanied Paul to the Council of Jerusalem on the subject of Mosaic rites. So there was a lot of talk about the Old Testament and he helped kind of understand it. He went to Corinth to remedy even fallouts between Timothy and Paul's painful visit. And you can read about that Uh, in in Corinthians, and he enjoyed much success working with Paul in places like Macedonia, acting as troubleshooter, peacemaker, administrator, and missionary. So in other words, Titus, all right, was an incredibly reliable man. And in this letter, we discover that Paul has assigned him the task, uh, go back one, of going to an island just off the coast of Greece called Crete, and maybe some of us have even been there uh, on holiday. But he was going there to restore order to a network of churches. Okay, so that's his aim. Now, Cretan culture was notorious. I don't know if you know this. It was notorious in the ancient world. Uh, Next slide. One of the Greek words for being a liar was kretizo. Okay, so to be a liar, and you might know this in English, is to be a cretin. All right, you've heard that. I hope you haven't, I hope no one's ever really called you that. I hope you haven't called anybody else that, but to be a cretin is to be a liar, okay? It describes someone who's untrustworthy and lazy, okay? Cretans were infamous for treachery and greed. Cities on Crete were unsafe, and there was violence and corruption abound, all right? As an aside, I visited Reading Town Centre for the first time the other day. Good luck. The city was unsafe. Now, the island, I love Reading, by the way, sorry. (laughs) Now, the island of Crete, next slide, was dotted with ports that bordered the Mediterranean Sea. So the Apostle Paul thought that this place would be a perfect place to set up that network of churches. These ports served many more cities. So it's a brilliant strategy. And we heard that he was a brilliant man. Now, we don't know the details, but somehow... These churches came under the influence of corrupt church leaders. I haven't heard of that before either, sadly. Who said they were Christians, but they were ruining, okay? They were ruining the churches. So Paul assigns Titus with the task of going there to set things straight. And in this letter, the book of Titus, that's what he's trying to do. Okay, so that's the context. He's saying, okay, things have gone a bit wrong in the churches, we need to get back to God, get back to his words, and this is what he writes. And Paul opens his letter with a prelude consisting of four verses. It's worth knowing that, next slide, Paul packs more into these opening verses, hear this again, he packs more 
into these opening verses than he does anywhere else in his letters, uh, save Romans, okay? The whole letter here is a microcosm, okay? When you read it, you'll see what I mean. And with it is a big picture, clear, insightful summary of Christian life. So he's been really specific about cramming lots of stuff into this opening section. It's about how God saves his people from eternity to eternity. And I'm gonna invite Jackie forward. Where are you, Jackie? I'm behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Um, but Jackie's going to read this opening section to us now. So let's turn our ears towards God's word. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that is in accordance with godliness, in the hope of eternal life that God never lies, promised before the ages began. In due time, he revealed his word through the proclamation with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Saviour. To Titus, my loyal child in the faith, we share grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Saviour. All right. Now, this is a very long sentence. So round of applause to Jackie, because she actually read one of the longest sentences in the Bible. So that's a good effort. Thank you. Was that all of it, by the way? That was, that's up to verse 5. I've now got to go down to verse 17. Okay, stay where you are. <laughs> that is a long sentence, and this prelude introduces an important theme underlying the whole letter. And if you're wondering what it is, it's truth. It's truth. Paul says he's writing this letter to further their faith, and he says their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. One of the problems in Cretan churches is that they had assimilated their ideas of Jesus, their Christian God, to their ideas about the Greek gods they had grown up with, specifically Zeus. It was claimed that Zeus was born on their island, and they loved to tell stories and mythologies about Zeus's underhand character where he seduced women and he, get this, he lied to get his way. And remember, Cretans were known to be liars and braggarts. So Paul's trying to be really clear to us here. The God revealed through Jesus is totally different from the God of society, in this case, Zeus. Okay, God's character traits are faithfulness and truth. In fact, notice how he says, uh, God who does not lie, all right? He makes a point. Paul is writing into a society where lying, deception, and cynicism are accepted. Does that sound like anywhere you know, all right? I, I use Twitter, and honestly, every week I'm almost like, I think I'm just going to pack it in. There's just so much false news on Twitter, uh, even on, on the TV now. I'm going to quote a pastor called Davis Mathis, he says, we are living in times when cynicism is not only acceptable, but in some places it's expected. It is mainstream, even admired. By cynicism, I mean the general disinclination to trust others, especially purported authorities, or the inclination to believe the worst in others and of the world altogether. And it is increasingly the air we breathe. It's talking about lying, deception, cynicism. And this mood of cynicism didn't appear out of nowhere. A number of writers generally believe that it is the result of secularism, the pretense that there is no God, all right, or at least that he's off limits in public discourse, all right? So because our society is built on lies, lies in the media, lies in politics, sadly, lies of our leaders, secularism offers ultimately no firm hope. Someone's truth is different from your truth. Who's going to define it? That's all very fluid. And it soon produces cynicism. And cynicism does not breed productive action, according to Paul. In fact, it breeds laziness. It did on the island of Crete in Titus's day, and some might argue it does in our day. So how does Paul counter the unbelief, cynicism, 
and laziness of Crete and its false teachers. I just lied to you, Jackie. <laughs> we only needed to go up to that verse. So do you want to grab a seat? That's fine. There we are, preaching to them myself. Thank you so much. Can we just thank Jackie for standing there for all that? <laughs> all right. Unsurprisingly, Paul writes with a countercultural message, just as countercultural today as it was then. And what's that message that the church brings? It's a message of hope. All right, we've acknowledged how broken the world is around us. But hope, genuine hope, objective hope, hope that affects productive lives. And in verse 2, he mentions himself the hope of eternal life. Then later in chapters 3, verse 7, he uses the exact same phrase, hope and eternal life. And in chapter 2, you'll hear next week, he refers to our blessed hope. Now, what cynicism gets right is that we are indeed living in a fallen world. Okay, I think most of us can agree to that. Our world is not what it was, as it should have been. Humankind sinned, sin entered in and remained. So here at this church, I often talk about Genesis, first book of the Bible, right? And as soon as sin enters the world, we find four things happen very quickly. Number one, humanity's relationship with God is ruptured. Humanity's relationship with one another, so Adam and Eve fall out, is ruptured between it. Humanity's relation with themselves, things like their mental health and how they view themselves, is ruptured. That's why they cover themselves with shame. And finally, humanity's relationship, even with creation, is also ruptured. And that's painted with the symbolism of leaving the garden. There are all these ruptures and brokenness in our lives. But this is precisely where we as Christians say, we recognize the brokenness and the doctrine of sin, even if you don't call it that. We recognize Christians aren't blindfolded to the fact that the world is messed up in many ways and there's a lot to be critical of. However, those who follow Christ can say and believe the story doesn't end there. During the baptism, if you follow the liturgy carefully, it talks of that story of stepping into baptism and stepping into the story of God, which is one of hope, grace, uh, and eternal life. Christians believe in redemption. We believe in change. Remember I told you a story of a young teenager who said, I like coming here because even if I've been wrong about something, I can say sorry, there's change, there's forgiveness, okay? So as Christians, we have a genuine hope. And one reason that hope is so important in this letter is that the opposition Titus is facing is not hopeful and not fruitful. The problem with people in Crete is that they do a lot of talking and not a lot of practical good. I can think of some politicians just come to mind. If we look at verse 10, it says, there are empty talkers and deceivers who must be silenced. Interesting. And they're not just liars, but lazy as well. Verse 16 says, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their actions. Their detestable disobedience, unfit for any good work. I just want to think of a, you may know a few years ago, a famous world leader across the Atlantic, and whether you're for him, that's kind of material, but when Trump stood outside the White House waving a Bible and saying, you believe everything I say, because I hear from God, or maybe he does. That's a pretty bold thing to do, right? It says here, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their actions. But Paul says we don't have to conform to these ways. We have hope. What is this hope? Let's look back at verses three and four. It says, and which now at this appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour. So here we have God as Saviour. But let's read on. To Titus, my loyal child in the faith, we share, and listen to these words, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. He's bringing grace and peace. And one of the ways, I suppose, we can look to our leaders, including leaders in the church, is the things they say and do. Do they usher in grace? Do they talk about peace 
and unity, or do they sow division? These are just some of the things that we can be attuned to as we pray into these situations. Here we are. God is our saviour. But let's read on. He says to Titus, my loyal child in the faith. Yeah, we share grace and peace from Christ the saviour. You see, the father and the son work together. And at our baptism, we talked about to the family, do you believe in God the father, God the son, God the Holy Spirit? The father and son work together. Both are rightly called saviour and yet are distinct. Father and son work together in saving their father. The father is not the son and son is not the Father. And if you're interested in the mysteriousness of the Holy Trinity and how it all works, I'm happy to chat about that. In fact, on Trinity Sunday a few weeks ago, we actually looked into that. But ultimately what we're saying is that God in his wholeness, in the Godhead, is all about salvation, about bringing hope. And finally, notice how Paul says, in due time, next slide, or in this translation, in the appointed season, he revealed his word. You see, the father sent his son not a moment too early or too late, but at the proper time, literally in his own time. Christmas is coming up where we think about God entering humanity through Christ. He came at the right time. And this is a priceless world, word for us in a world like ours with sin and disappointments, loss, tragedy, sickness, pandemics. God comes in his own time, not ours, and he never gets it wrong. Who likes Lord of the Rings? In fact, we're going to be having a movie night here in a few months, and they'll be probably showing possibly Lord of the Rings. It's like Gandalf says, I'm going to quote Gandalf, I can't believe I'm doing this. He says, he always arrives precisely when he means to. Remember, you're talking about Gandalf. He always arrives precisely when he means to. Emmanuel, God with us. From Christ's first coming to his second and to our lives, God always works at the proper time. Today I've talked about very kind of major things in society, but even in the crises impacting our personal lives. Maybe you're dealing with people who are lying to you or really manipulative, you know, and really difficult to work with and know how to press your buttons uh, and possibly even, you know, coerce you. A word of encouragement is God is here. He comes to you. He is God with us. And there is hope in that situation. Okay, I'm going to end not with a passage from Titus, but actually one from 1 Peter, which I feel really encapsulates kind of the hope that we've looked at today. Let me read it um, over us. It says this. It says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so he may exalt you, ready, in due time. Okay, that's God's timing. It says, cast all your anxieties on him. So I think about the anxieties we might have looking at the world because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, and how? Steadfast in your faith. For you know that your brothers and sisters in all the worlds are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And yet after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, okay, strengthen and establish you. To him be power forever and ever. And that is the hope we have in him. Amen. 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 When my
attitude of worship let's just declare the creed i believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth i believe in jesus christ his only son scriptures ascended into heaven he is seated at the right hand of the father and he will come to judge the living and the dead i believe in the holy spirit the holy catholic church the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of life life everlasting amen amen please be seated and just as i invite Jill forward to lead us in our intercessions. That hymn, Cornerstone, in the last verse, there were those lovely words, weren't there? Please come forward. Uh, in him may I be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. And earlier on at the start of our service, we had that beautiful picture, didn't we, of Layla clothed, dressed in that beautiful white gown of righteousness. So just to try and connect us with that symbolism, is that idea that as she was baptized into Christ, which all of us are invited to, so she is clothed with righteousness. Let that be a picture for you if you find yourself struggling these days. We have that in our midst. But thank you, Jill, for leading us now in our prayers. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise, worship, and give thanks to you for your unconditional, everlasting love for each one of us. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with our prayers, bringing our worries, fears, and needs to your loving presence. Heavenly Father, as your word has told us today, may we as your children, holy and dearly loved, conduct ourselves in ways that honour you, being hospitable and generous, ones who love what is good, who are self-disciplined, upright, holy and disciplined, as we witness to the life-giving eternal hope we have in you. 
We give thanks today, Lord Jesus, for the joy of Layla's baptism and pray for your blessing upon Layla, her parents and godparents, as they grow in their knowledge and love of you. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the joy of our families and friends, and also for the love and care of our church family here at St John's. We pray for your blessing and strength for Mark as he leads us, and for his family too. We pray especially today, Lord, for wisdom and discernment for Mark and all who are part of the Crown Nominations Committee as they begin the process to appoint a new Bishop of Reading. Loving God, we lift you now, all who are unwell, in body, mind or spirit, and pray for your loving care and healing mercy for each one. We lift you too for your sustaining love and strength, all who care for their loved ones. We pray, Lord, for the balm of your Holy Spirit for all who grieve, to give them comfort and strength in their pain and loss, and pray they will find peace and rest in the hope you have set before us. As we go into a new week, Heavenly Father, we pray you will fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit so we can be salt and light, a beacon of your love in this world, so that many will come to know the peace, strength and hope we have in you. Amen. 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 Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. God will speak his peace to his people, to those who turn to him in their hearts. And so the peace of the Lord be always with you. So at this point in the service, we just take a moment just to greet one another and share the peace. So let's do that now as we move into that time. Peace be with you. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength. My song is cornerstone, is solid ground.
Christ commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns. Wise and gracious God, you spread a table before us. Nourish your people with the word of life and the bread of heaven. Amen. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, you made the world and you love your creation. As we've heard, you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to be our saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you, and he broke the bread. He gave it to them and said, Take, eat, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. And again, he praised you. He gave it to them and he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once and for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes again in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen on the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. And here we are, through Christ, with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, honour, glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. And just as our children join us, let us say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. At the beginning of the service, we had that beautiful symbol of baptism, that sacrament. And now we share in this sacrament together. And it's wonderful that we invite our children to join us. So please come forward.
All right, let us just say the prayer after communion as all of us have come before God. We say, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. All right, we're just going to have our final hymn and blessing, but just before that, a few notices. Again, we have tea and coffee after the service in the church hall. Um, also, a lot of our weekly programs have started up again. So we have lunch munch in a chinwag on Friday. It's a really nice lunch in the old church hall. Michael, has art started? Okay, on Mondays, we have an art group um, that meets. And I also think our Tuesday, Wednesday kind of prayer Bible study groups have also started up. So if that's something you'd like to get into this new academic term, uh, please check out the website or talk to me after the service. And finally,
Thank you.